Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. We are joined today by Mike Rose, who is a research professor in the Department of Education of UCLA, California. He's the author of several books, including Why School, Back to School and Possible Lives. We're going to be talking about education and some of the uh, the themes explored in these books. And we'll be focusing in particular on his book, The Mind at Work, Valuing the Intelligence of the American Worker, which challenges the long-held notion that people who work with their hands make up a less intelligent class. Hello, Mike. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Uh, Thank you, Barry. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's a real pleasure you being here, Mike. Anyway, could you uh, perhaps begin by telling us something of your, your background? What prompted you to, to um, choose education as your vocation and also why you decided to write The Mind at Work? Sure. So um, I think the first thing to know about me is that I come from uh, Italian immigrant parents and grew up um, pretty poor yeah. and And uh, we, uh, you know, we kind of held life together. My mother was a a waitress her whole life. My father was ill. My uncles all worked in the smokestack industry. So, you know, in railroad and steel and auto, that sort of thing. Uh So the kind of work that I write about in the mind at work, you know, blue collar and service work is work that I saw from a very young age. Yes. Um. As far as how I ended up in education, it's kind of circuitous. I I didn't do particularly well in school at all. And it wasn't until my senior year in high school that I had an English teacher who really turned my life around and he managed to talk me into going to college. I got into a small college on probation and stumbled a little bit and then kind of found my way. Um. I fell into teaching in my early 20s because there was a program here in the United States called Teacher Corps where young people could volunteer to work for a couple years in an underprivileged district and um, and receive training in education while we did that. And many of the people who were in that program went on to some kind of career in education. So that was how it all happened, Barry. And gee, for the first 10 years of my teaching life, I worked with just all kinds of folks from little kids to adults in literacy programs to returning Vietnam veterans who wanted to go to college. And it was just the richest, uh, most rewarding experience doing all that kind of work. And that's what locked me into education. Fantastic. It's interesting when you, you said like so many people, maybe the catalyst or the turning point for you was a, a teacher that somehow engaged you in, in the learning process, or, or was it partly because he took an interest in you as well? You hear that so often, don't you? Yeah, and I certainly do. I, I, I hear it quite a bit. And I think the answer to your question, it, it was both. I mean, he was he was a dynamic young guy. He was very stimulating. He He was smart as a whip. And he just immersed us in literature in a way that, uh, you know, I had never experienced before. So it was really challenging and I wanted to rise to the challenge. Sure. But as you said, he was also one of these people who just took an interest in me. You know, he I guess he figured I had some potential that I had no idea about myself and um, really worked with me and browbeat me into um, going to college, and I'm certainly glad he did. You know, I'm still in touch with him, by the way. Wow, well, that's that's um, great. Isn't that wonderful? He yep. he he was only about six or seven years older than we were, and um, uh, we fell out of touch for a very long time, and then reconnected. And I see him about once or twice a year now. And I got to tell you, it's a it's a very important part of my life because this guy literally changed my life. Yeah. Oh, what a lovely story. Anyway, could you tell us a little bit about the the process of writing the the book, The Mind at Work, Mike? I mean, I I thought it was 
I thought it was a wonderful book, and and it was, it was it was really accessible, engaging, and and quite humbling at times, while at the same time you know being being very informative. I I can imagine that that's quite a difficult balance to strike. Well, gosh, thank you for saying that and for noticing it. Yeah, it took a while. It took six years to write the book. Um, you know, for a very long time, I think that I have been bothered by the by the way that at least in the United States here um by the way that we so easily throw around the word intelligence and and think that we have good measures of it through the typical kind of standardized intelligence tests that that everybody gets either in school or in the military and I been similarly bothered by some of the things that I've heard as I've moved through school and, you know, lived a professional life. I've been bothered by some of the things I've heard Mm -hmm. about the smarts of the kind of people who formed my background, you know, who are my family. Um, Just statements that people will make about, you know, folks who work with their hands. And all of this stuff kind of came together um, at one point when I decided that I was basically going to take all of this training that I had in cognitive psychology and educational psychology, that I was going to take all this training and turn it back onto the folks who form the, the whole backdrop of my upbringing and who work with their hands, who work in blue collar and service jobs. I wanted to use these tools that I had developed to really explore and reveal the considerable smarts it takes to do all the different kinds of work that make the world go round. And and so I guess you could say that the mind at work was a kind of bringing together of these two very different parts of my life. I'm just going to ask you a couple of uh, general questions here before we we delve uh, into the book in a bit more detail. To, To what degree do you think we as a species are by nature's makers and problem solvers you know set up from an evolution perspective to to do things that matter yeah well you know there's a there's a term and 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 i mean it's latin and and it goes back quite a far way but um to to refer to human beings as you know homo faber man the maker yeah and um i think there's there's really something to that it gets to the way that we have always as a species use tools of some kind or another we've 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 fashioned all these different implements you know from uh, from a simple stick to very elaborate kinds of technologies in order to enable us to make things and to test things and to make our imprint on the world and and i think part of part of that is this search for meaning that you also alluded to you know if we're if we are makers, we're also meaning seekers. You know, we, we, at least every culture that I'm familiar with in some way or another, we seek to understand things. We create mythological systems or various kinds of social systems that help us explain and order things. So we are both makers and, and meaning seekers by nature. Yeah. And that they, rather than separate them, they seem inextricably linked in, in many ways, don't they? They sure do. Okay, well, we readily appreciate this way of engaging with the world, especially, you know, with with professions like a neurosurgeon or a concert pianist or a sculptor. But but you argue that this dynamic multi-dimensional intelligence is is likewise also very much part of the the manual workers interaction with their work environment. But why do you think there is this tendency to look down on such work and not see the intricacy and intelligence involved in in saying being a a carpenter or a hairstylist. Yeah. So I think, you know, I guess as with most things, you know, uh, there's there's multiple, multiple reasons to explain that. One is, I think, just ignorance in a way. You know, a, a lot of us who have not done this kind of work don't know all that goes into it. You know, we see the end result and certainly you know, when our drains are backed up or something, we desperately want that plumber to come out yeah. and we appreciate uh, his or her skill. But but we don't necessarily know all that's involved in the work. So, so I think part of it is that. But I think part of it, too, and this is something that I try to get at in the mind at work, part of it is just 
social stratification, you know, social class and, and all of the, she was all of the kind of status dynamics and separations and distance, social distances that come with this business of social class. So we don't, we don't share a lot of time and intimate space with folks who live in quite different social classes. Um, and, and so I think that that social class plays. So it's ignorance, it's social class, it's social stratification. It's, it's these things that people that we do to each other that are so unfortunate. Yeah. In, in relation to this, like the, the people working in these professions arguably do tend to get lower scores in IQ or academic tests than, than, than say average. Now this presumably also drives the assumption that they are in some way less intelligent now you challenge this assumption on, on on several grounds could you could you elaborate yeah sure and and i think that that correlation often has to do more with years in school rather than the occupation per se yeah. in other words if if we were able to take a subsample of carpenters plumbers and hairstylists all of whom had gone to university i can guarantee you that their iq tests will be much higher sure because one of the things, one of the surest things we know that, I mean, Barry, there's a ton of controversy around intelligence tests, Every, everything from the statistical procedures used to um, calculate the scores that we get from the tests, everything from that to just the very construction of them themselves. So, so there's tons of controversy around all this stuff. But one thing that we know for sure and that everybody agrees to is that they correlate highly with years in school. Yeah, because the items on the typical intelligence test, by and large, match the kind of items that we get in school, particularly ones having to do with mathematics and ones having to do with with language. So and also just, you know, that we get familiar with taking those kinds of tests in school and we learn that they're important. So we put time into them. So there's all these reasons that schooling correlates with scores on intelligence tests. So I think the first thing to say is that that when we see, let's say, that, you know, by and large, blue collar folk or service workers might have a lower average uh, intelligence test score, I think we could chalk that up more to years in school. Yeah, and it, I suppose and it's not just the kind of school. It's back to your teacher that, that got you interested. It's It's having a school that, you know, manages to engage with the students as well. Exactly right. Precisely right. Um, so, so that is a, that is a big piece of that correlation. Now, what's intriguing to me is that when you get close to the work and you spend time and you watch the kinds of things folks do, they are solving problems and using knowledge and applying knowledge and troubleshooting and thinking things through and bringing concepts to bear on on individual cases of, you know, of styling hair, plumbing or whatnot. And, and so you see all of these examples of a rich mind at work. I, I'll just, I'm just going to reel off some. Um, the, the hairstylist who's able to take just some vague kinds of things that a client says and with, you know, some hand gestures and a little more discussion and maybe grabbing a picture in a magazine, the stylist is able to convert all of that into an actual hairstyle that is aesthetically pleasing to a client. Or let's take the plumber who in an old house reaches up inside a wall to feel the pipes that he can't see because they're hidden by the wall. And through feeling those pipes is visualizing what they look like, the amount of corrosion, the configuration and whatnot. And through that, combination of feel and visualization making judgments yeah. about what he needs to do or or the waitress the waitress at least in the united states the uh, sort of standard occupational classification system lists waitressing as very as low skilled work and yet when you see the way a waitress in a busy restaurant is making these decisions on the fly these quick decisions about what to do next and what to prioritize. Um, she's reading social cues from customers. She's 
being vigilant to what's going on in the restaurant, how long an order is taking, who's tapping their cup with their spoon because they want to refill, you know. All of these manifestations of intelligence would not get picked up on a typical intelligence test. Exactly. So, so the stuff that happens right under our noses all the time that bespeaks of smarts, we're just not going to, it's not going to get picked up. So it's almost it's commonplaceness that, in a sense, blinds us to it. That's a, that's a really nice way to put it, actually. Yes, because of its commonplaceness, because of its everydayness, in a way, um, because of our superficial familiarity with it, we don't grant it the kind of intellectual weight that we do other things. And yet, as I said, when you get in close to it, or God forbid, when you try to do it, <laughs> you you find out, in fact, what it demands. Yeah, uh, and especially when you were talking about the plumber there, that the mind-body-hand-brain dichotomy also seems to be very much in, de- in evidence here. Do you think mm-hmm. advances in neuroscience and psychology are, are now seriously challenging these assumptions? Yeah, in the West, you know, we have been, for, you know, several hundred years, we've been in the in the kind of philosophical tradition of the, the of Descartes and the Cartesian kind of split between mind and body, that yeah. these are two very separate domains of human existence. And you're right, um, what cognitive psychology, cognitive science uh, has been exploding is exactly that notion. I mean, there's a whole area of cognitive, psychi- so, cognitive psychology and, and uh Cognitive science these days referred to as embodied cognition, which takes a very different fundamental point of view toward these things. And that is that there is an intimate and inseparable interaction between that thing that sits inside our skull and our bodies and the environment. And it's this profound interaction of, you know, mind, body, environment. Uh, material, tools, uh, all of this that accounts for so much of the cognitive work that gets done day by day. Yeah. Okay, Mike. So, so what what does intelligence mean to you, and how does it uh, compare to someone's understanding of it uh, living, say, two hundred years ago, or for that matter, in a different part of the world today? So, again, you know, as I said earlier, the, the whole notion of intelligence and what it is and how we assess it and all that is, you know, is, 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 is certainly not a settled and simple thing. It's, it's controversial. There's tons of debates about it. Um, I, I think that some of the standard kinds of definitions that we get of intelligence in the West are good enough. And I'm, I'm just going to reel off a few of those that. You know, the ability to learn and act on the environment is a is a signal or a indicator of an intelligence or a d- definer of intelligence to apply to apply knowledge uh, to new situations. Right. To apply yeah. things we know to something that's unfamiliar um, to reason, to plan, to solve problems. These are some other words that pop up all the time when we look at definitions of intelligence in the West. And I'm I'm fine with those uh, definitions. My concern is that we tend to apply them so narrowly. So so getting back to a point I made earlier, we don't see or we wouldn't include in typical assessments of intelligence those instances of the hairstylist coming to some kind of a pleasing style based on just some vague conversation or um, that plumber uh, diagnosing a problem through touch and visualization or the waitress navigating a really busy work environment. Um, That is certainly evidence of acting on the environment, of applying knowledge to new situations, that sort of thing. Um, it's just that we wouldn't tend to include those those kinds of activities in our uh, deployment of, of, of the kinds of definitions that I just said. So my problem is not so much that some of the standard ways we talk about intelligence, um, my problem is not so much that they are woefully inadequate. It's that we don't apply them broadly enough. We apply them in very narrow ways. Now, 
let me say one more thing to your point. It is also true that many of our standard definitions of intelligence leave things out that other definitions of intelligence or certainly other cultures definitions of intelligence would include as indicators of intelligence. So, for example, in typical discussions of intelligence in the West, we don't include things like creativity or aesthetic response or emotional attunement. Right. Yeah. But we other folks do have definitions of intelligence that would include those characteristics. And in fact, other cultures may emphasize some of those much more so that um, some cultures, for example, would would consider being able to live in harmony with others as a sign of intelligence. Yeah. They might also include what we would call reasoning or problem solving or acting on the environment, that sort of thing. But they have different further elements of their definition of intelligence. And then the, the, the final thing to say in response to your, your really provocative question, I think, is if so let's say we bumped ourselves, we got in our time machine, we went back a couple hundred years. OK. Um, well, we would probably still if we were talking about intelligence, certainly we wouldn't be talking about intelligence tests or anything like that, right? They, they didn't exist then. So we would talk about it in different ways, but it would include probably some of these kinds of notions like reasoning or applying old knowledge to new and new situations. But the focus of what we would consider intelligent behavior might be well might well be different from what we have today because the environment was different. So probably being able to visually make certain kinds of distinctions in an agrarian economy, let's say, it was, would be much heightened a couple hundred years ago than it would be now. So do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I can imagine. Yeah, the surround, our environmental surround, is absolutely going to affect the way we think about these things. Of course, yeah. Okay, you um, you mentioned your, your your mother briefly at the beginning of our chat, and and you actually interviewed her for the book, and yeah. and the and the story of her working life as a waitress is the subject of the first chapter of the book. Was that your intention from the beginning when you first got the idea of the book? Yeah. So, you know, from the beginning, I, I, and this thing this thing has been in some way or another germinating for a while. Um, and I think from the beginning, I knew, I knew that I wanted to some way or another include some of my family's history into the book. It's just, it's, you know, it's the way I write, Barry. I try yeah. very much to um, take, you know, uh, abstract stuff or academic sort of things. And, and I try to, keep the, the the rigor of it, but I, I also try very hard to write about it in ways that are engaging and accessible. And, you know, there's nothing like a good story, a good narrative line to help one do that. Yeah. And, and so from the beginning, I had thought that I would include some of the stories of my own uh, working class forebears. And that would certainly include my mother, who Okay, well, um, this this can sort of give us a bit of a snapshot of the book. How, how did a typical working day for your mother pan out? Yeah, so so when I did decide then that that she would be central, a central character in the waitressing chapter, I, I interviewed uh, a lot of other waitresses and bartenders and in a range from a range of kinds of restaurants, you know, from high end snazzy joints to to much more family style, inexpensive restaurants like the ones my mother worked in. But I decided I did want to make her a kind of central character because, you know, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be writing this book. I wouldn't have been in school. I wouldn't have been, God knows where I'd have been. She kept the roof over our heads, you know, by doing this work. A typical day for her. And I got to see it often because when I was a little kid, my father um, and I, who, who was who was sick, uh, my father and I would take the bus downtown and go sit at the counter if she was working at the counter or we'd sit in the back of the restaurant um, 
if she was working the floor and she typically worked a really busy time. So, you know, breakfast or, or lunch, sometimes both of those shifts and she would be on the move. So she was working feverishly, you know, that kind of fast, quick movement and walk that waitresses have, um, very attentive to customers, that kind of, you know, smiling engagement, uh, attentive, sharp, um, attuned to what's going on in the restaurant, making these kinds of decisions. She, she would talk to me about it and say how you would just be, how would she say she would, you would run yourself ragged was the phrase she used. Yeah. If, if you didn't organize these tasks in a way that they all flowed and that you maximized your energy, you know, that you worked smart. So that would be a, that would be a day in the restaurant for her. But what was so interesting to me too, Barry, is that there were other aspects of her day that folks wouldn't see if they weren't, you know, living with her. So for example, she would, come home and she was just wiped out when she was on the floor she seemed like an endless well of energy but it's exhausting work and so i'd get to see the exhaustion as well i'd get to see her you know lay out her tips on an old towel and count out these nickels and dimes and quarters Uh, and those nickels and dimes and quarters were what kept food in the icebox for us um, I would also hear her talk about her regular customers, because here's the other dimension of work for my mother. It was really valuable to her, not only financially, but because here this immigrant Italian woman who had a very cloistered and closed life as a young girl, um, she got to be, as she put it, among the public, which was a really which was a source of real pride for her that she was able to serve and engage this broad public that would come into her restaurant. And that included, you know, people from the hospital next door or the businessman from down the street or whatever. And she got to know them and and would hear their family stories and she would share hers. And so she would talk about some of these things that they told her uh, late at night. So, So the working day for her was all of this physical output combined with all this thinking but then at the end of the day there also was the you know these these social rewards if you will and this real sense of pride that she was able to do this very hard work and do it very very well yeah now i can imagine that so how did you set out the rest of the book mike i mean um you got your mother in that chapter but there was also various chapters focusing on other professions but then you broadened it out at the end. Could you could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So what I wanted to do again, you know, I wanted to tell a good story. This is really important to me to to have a book that, that has intellectual substance, but conveys that substance in a in a you know in some kind of narrative way that is pleasing. So what I wanted to do was I I set out through these first six chapters to take us in close to these various kinds of work. So waitressing, hairstyling, some of the construction trades, factory work, welding, these sorts of things. And we get to, you know, we get in close to the carpentry shop, to the the welding bench, to the stylist salon. We see this work unfold. We kind of get the insider's view. And then after this collection, if you will, of insider portraits, as you say, I kind of open the lens up and then start to ask these broader questions based on what we've read so far. These broader questions about the things that we've been discussing, what, what in fact does go on in the workplace and in terms of uh, intelligence and, and why do we tend to see it in certain ways rather than others? And what are the implications for our narrow notions of intelligence for, for schooling or for job training or for the way that we organize work or or on a broader scale for the way we live with each other and then i spend a fair amount of time talking about school and the way school has 
again, separated the academic from the vocational and some of the negative consequences of that. And then as the book comes to an end, that lens continues to open to, you know, to continue to, to, to ask these questions about how do we define intelligence? What gets left out in our typical definitions? Uh, how does social class play into this? How does schooling play into it? And, you know, how can we come to maybe more equitable understandings of the tremendous amount of mental work that's involved in the kinds of work that make the world go round, that, as I said, uh, goes on right under our noses and that we tend to not see. Uh, I'm just thinking as well that um, I spent uh, quite a, a bit of my own working life uh, doing manual work and a lot of the stuff in the book uh, I could really relate. For example, in my 20s, I, um, I was a carpenter for a number of years. Ah. And um, one of the things that, that I really loved about it was that, and I've never quite got from a, another profession, was that the, at the end of the day, um, you'd actually, apart from the physicality, I loved working with wood and, um, and I loved being outdoors, but it was this feeling at the end of the day, you'd actually created something. You could stand back and have <laughs> a look at that. And you, that was... That was really powerful. You got that every day, and you got this affirmation of your um, your efforts of the day. And um, I, I then went on to being a teacher. And uh, well, while, while I love teaching, and I, especially uh, helping people to learn how to learn and uh, and the engagement with people. But that sense of progress is is a bit harder to sort of grasp. It's <laughs> it's more uh, mm. rather than the, the the concrete nature of uh, uh, my end product at the end day of a carpenter. Oh my gosh. Yeah, this, <laughs> you're making me think of so many moments that I tried to capture in the book. I'll just give you one. Um, in, in the chapter on carpentry, I, I spend a fair amount of time in that chapter in a, uh, I spend a whole year in a wood construction class in a high school, uh, because I, I wanted to watch the development of skill, you know, so in addition to, to showing ability fully formed as as we see with somebody like my mother, let's say, and her her waitressing skill. Um, I also wanted to watch these abilities develop. So I spent, as I said, I spent about a year in this class, this woodworking class, this carpentry class, and oh my gosh, I got to see the kind of development that, you know, that leads from someone beginning and sort of stumbling around to a decent level of proficiency. Not great, but, you know, moving along. And I remember this one scene where one of the things that these that this teacher had these kids do that was really purposeful, I thought, was that he took in jobs. Um, and some of those jobs came from the school itself. So the, the secretaries in the office and the office manager needed some new cupboards built and installed in the little work area behind the offices. And this young man was the lead carpenter in this little team of students who built these cabinets and installed them. And to see him go in once it's all done and the plates and the teacups and everything else are in this cabinet, and we go in together and the doors open and close just beautifully. And the, the finish is just right. And the, you know, the, the fit of everything is, is on the money. And I'm standing back with him and we're looking at it and he just kind of shakes it, shakes his head and he says, it looks really nice, doesn't it? <laughs> and I, and I said, yes. And he says, man, this feels so good. Yeah. So that's exactly the kind of thing I think that you're talking about, that sense of concrete, tangible accomplishment. I'm, I've never quite got that back since. I now have a not altogether dissimilar experience from you, from your mum, uh, but not not as I'm sure not as difficult. But I have a, a guest house and I do breakfast and I go out and serve in the morning. And one one thing that, that you said in the book that I related to as well, that it's actually when it gets quite hectic, when you sort of get into a sense of flow, you really feel that you are doing things well when you're 
pushed to your limits. Yeah, I think your mother said that, and I could really relate to that. You know, that was one of the things that surprised me um, was as I was talking both to my mother and to this range of waitresses that in, included, you know, y- younger women all the way up to folks who were much more seasoned. And they all talked about that. And I was a little surprised because I know from my mother, but also from watching these other folks, I just know how hard it is when things are really rushed and, yeah. and humming. And yet all of them talked about that. They talked about the, oh gosh, how can I say, the kind of pleasure that they get out of feeling like, as one waitress said, like your body's a well-oiled machine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that, that you are just on your game, you know, you are, and, and, and the more they talked about it, the more sense it made to me, right? Just in the same way that an athlete rises to an occasion and appreciates that sense of performance. That was what I heard from them. And that's not to deny that it's exhausting. It's not to deny that it can even be injurious. It's not to deny yeah. you're wiped out when it's over. But yeah, they would rather be hitting on all cylinders than, than not. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Mike, the, the middle way, as we understand it, is the idea that we make better judgments by avoiding fixed or dogmatic beliefs about things, whether those are positive or negative. That then arguably throws us back onto experience. So we're left in this sort of messy, uncertain middle. But it, but it's, but it's, but it's in this messy, uncertain middle that we we actually start to get to grips more radically with the uh, with the phenomena that we encounter, whatever they are. To what extent does uh, does this the middle way relate to what we've been, uh, you know, might relate to what we've been talking about today? Yes, I, I think there's a really nice connection. And this is um, something I thought about since you contacted me, you know, in, in a way, um, in a way, the mind at work is is an attempt to go right to the heart of so many of these binaries that we have about about intelligence and work and skill and value um if you think about it that there, there, so much of our language so much of our discourse about education and work and intelligence revolves around these kind of binaries i, I have a place in the book where i just list them i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna reel a few of them off to you yeah. you know yeah. brain versus hand and abstract versus concrete and intellectual versus practical academic versus vocational pure research versus applied research um uh, a big one in the last 20 years or so when talking about the economy you know, the new economy versus the old economy or new knowledge work versus old industrial work or a metaphor that was floating around here in the States for a while was neck up versus neck down. That, oh, that, wow. the, that the knowledge work, the, the work of the new economy, that was neck up work yeah. and old industrial work, that was neck down work. That's awful, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, think about the implications of that, that that everything that our forebears did that involved any kind of industrial or service work was just all done out of sort of brute strength or courage or whatever, but no intelligence. I mean, it's just, but so the, these kinds of oppositions, these kinds of dichotomous ways of seeing the world, it seems to me are just so flawed and, they lie at the heart of some of the kinds of tangles that I try to get it get us out of in the mind at work. You, you know, when I'm working with my students, one thing that will inevitably come up when we're talking about, you know, whatever it is we're talking about, is I tell them, if you ever run across any kind of a presentation in social science that gives you some kind of a dichotomy or a binary, run from it. And <laughs> because... Fortunately, a lot of social science has run away from yeah. from those kinds of those kinds of slits. But they're just to your point. I think they take us away from the complex, messy reality of human experience. And it's a shame, I think, that the kinds of blinders that 
we've been talking about related to the mind at work, social class barriers or ignorance because of differences in education or whatnot, the way those blinders keep us from really engaging that messy human reality when it comes to so much of the kind of work that people do. Yeah, that's great, Mike. Okay, my last question. If if people wanted to find out more about your work, how would they go about it? Um, I guess the the most immediate way would be to just go to my website, which is, you know, www.mikerosebooks.com. So Mike Rose Books is all one word. Yeah. MikeRoseBooks.com. And there they'll, you know, they'll be able to see some of the different books and uh, opinion pieces and commentaries and radio interviews and stuff like that. So, you know, it's all packed in there. Smashing. Okay, well, it's been a, a absolute pleasure talking to you today, Mike. And I would, I've only read one of your books, The Mind at Work, but I would highly recommend it to anyone. It's just, um, uh, just such a great read. And um, thank you very much for for talking to me today. Oh, Barry, thank you so much, and thanks for connecting with me and taking the time to do this. I really enjoyed talking with you. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.